Good afternoon and welcome to our Artificial Intelligence in Retail Conference. We are very excited to be hosting you today. My name is Anzele Lovu. Um, in the past few months, we have seen a tremendous growth in the e-commerce space and with so many retail organizations, um, organizations venturing into the uh, retail or online environment. So we, we, we thought it is opportune time to create um, you know, a platform like this where we engage with um, C-level executives from the retail industry uh, to talk about uh, you know, these exponential technologies, artificial intelligence, um, you know, um, virtual reality, you name them. And uh, we believe that um, a, a conference like this will enable so many organizations uh, you know, to navigate the online environment and, of course, improve their customer experiences, uh, operational efficiencies, etc. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, at the end of this conference, uh, you know, we would have uh, benefited a lot. And to say the least, we would actually have created a foundation for future engagements um, and, and collaborations. Now, my, my task today is very simple. It is, it is to introduce our, our program director, uh, who is going to lead us through uh, today's conversations. And that is Claire Mathis. And uh, Claire is the owner of GadgetGirl.com, which is an online portal that provides gadget reviews um, and uh, information around latest technologies and innovations. Um, she has uh, been a, a journalist and editor for some renowned uh, media um, uh, houses or ICT magazines, and she has co-hosted uh, a plethora of uh, tech shows on uh, SAFM, Power FM, Cliff Central, you name them. And uh, today she's going to facilitate all the conversations that uh, we're going to have. And I'm very excited. Uh, I look forward to a very enterprising uh, discussions today. Um, now, without wasting much time with the introductory talk, I will hand over to Claire Mathis to take us through. Claire, are you ready? Yes, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. And that awesome. introduction, I don't think anybody could do. You can stay, Zinzele, you can stay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Presents. So yes, I just want to welcome everyone to the AI and Retail Conference, or better yet, the Transforming Retail with Artificial Intelligence Conference, which is hosted by Machine Learning Africa and sponsored by Genesis, so thank you very much. Um, today, we are going to have a few um, sessions, a little, few little talks first, and we will end off with a round table, a discussion in about, obviously, retail with art artificial intelligence. So our first speaker is Peter van Aysen. Um, he's going to be, he is the principal solution consultant for Genesis, and he is going to be talking about sell faster and more to your digital customer. So in his demo, we will hopefully learn, or we should learn, how artificial intelligence can help by predicting outcomes and triggering engagements um, with the right sales resources in real time, at the right time, with the right pr prospect. So that should be interesting. Um, we will move on to Gary Alleman, the MD of Master Data Management, and he will be talking about why data integrity is critical in preparing for AI. And um, our last speaker before the roundtable will be Yugesh Freilink, the Chief Experience Officer at the CX Group, um, talking about AI, VR, and its impact to the customer and organization's experiences. Um, and as I said, we'll be ending off with a round table discussion um, where you are more than welcome or welcome to pose your questions, which you will find in your um, on your platform on the right hand side. Sometimes I don't know my right from my left, so let's hope I got it right. Um, on the right hand side, there is a raised hand um, and a chat facility and a questions facility. So um, if we could maybe try and leave questions to last, um, that's when we've allocated some time. So you are more than welcome to pop your questions in there and we will get straight to them. So otherwise I would normally go for housekeeping and things like that, but I'm sure you all know where the ladies and gents are seeing as you streaming from home, I think, or the office. So without further ado, could we please welcome Peter van Aysen, who will be telling us about sell faster and more to your digital customer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, and thank you so much for the intro, Claire. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I'll start sharing my, my screen in a moment. I'm going to switch off my video whilst I do this, just because uh, 
I don't want to impact the bandwidth just with the kids doing, you know, what kids do on the Xbox and the internet. So just not to impact the bandwidth. So just give me a second and I'll start sharing uh, and kicking off the, the, the session. Right. So I hope everybody can see the very nice bright orange uh, beginning slide. Um, so yes, my topic uh, of discussion is sell faster and more to your digital customer. Um, Peter from Asian Principal Solution Consultant. Um, and yeah, uh, with, from Genesis. So who is Genesis? That. Yeah, great. So Genesis is not just a contact center or customer experience company. Genesis, we pride ourselves in a, a being a global leader in customer experience technology, uh, enabling our customers to provide personalized, connected moments to their customers through artificial intelligence, engagement channel uh, orchestration, and workforce engagement. That's become pretty uh, important these days um, with everybody working from home, with trying to adjust to working from home and being almost connected for more time than we were usually before, uh, where you could basically try, uh, you know, draw the line between work and 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 and, uh, and home and get that work-life balance going. So that, those lines seem to be blurring a little bit. With a global network of more than 1,200 partners, 11,000 customers, and then because of that, being at the center of 70 billion interactions per year globally, we have learned from these interactions that customers and personalized experiences uh, that are context contextually relevant to them in the very moment they need it. And that's why experience as a service starts with people. So it's no longer just customer, you know, let's say uh, software as a service or um, platform as a service. The new category that we're pioneering is experience as a service. Um, and that's really targeted giving that personalized, contextually relevant experience at the moment that the customers need them. So a little bit more about what experience as a service is. It's our vision of an empathetic customer-centric experience with the customer at the center and empathy being the core of any good relationship and good communications, showing the other party that you know them, that you care enough to learn about them and to remember what they've shared with you in the past, especially in this time of crisis where empathy is more needed than ever. We are using AI to leverage all of the customer and employee data, including historical, third party and behavioral data that has been shared from website visits, digital engagements or calls in the past. Uh, even now, I, I think we started talking about this in, in the industry several years ago. And I think in our personal lives, when you contact a service provider or, or a company that you are subscribed to or a member of, more often, almost always, but more often than not, you have to firstly identify yourself perhaps once if you're lucky, but more than, in most cases, you have to do that more than once. And normally you have to uh, provide context over and over as you speak to different people. So this is definitely a problem we have to overcome. And luckily with uh, AI, um, that now becomes possible to a greater extent. We're also engaging at the right moment across the entire customer experience from marketing, sales, and customer care or service. So marketing and sales has always traditionally been, been a siloed or different section or different department within any uh, service, um, uh, company that provides services to customers. Um, but we need to break down those silos um, to get that holistic information to the agents and to the customers. So again, experience as a service is personalized, empathetic, customer-centric communications that demonstrates empathy in order to establish trust and which leads to loyalty by showing the customer that you know them. Right. So to bring it back to the, the topic of the discussion with regards to retail, we need to understand what those top trends are. So first of all, lost margins on retail assets and shopping cart abandonment. So first, retailers or re retail customers are uh, basically a fierce fickle bunch, more empowered than ever before. I mean, we can access all um, online commerce or retail platforms from almost you know, anywhere. They're capable of getting things done and have become expert at being customers. Retailers have trained many loyal customers to wait for promotions, markdowns, and, and return products, doing nothing to grow high-value customers. This vicious cycle of price slashing is not sustainable. So retail profit margins are razor thin, and digital-first competitors are playing the long game when it comes to profit, profitability. And then when it comes to cart embedment, you know, there's several reasons for this, um, based on many surveys and many market research uh, reports. 
some of which being extra costs and too expensive shipping options perhaps. Site requires the creation of an account, uh, a too long or too complicated checkout process, and so forth. Secondly is the omni-channel convenience gap. And that's one of those areas that uh, Genesis um, is, is uh, pretty strong in. Retailers are often multi-channel rather than omni-channel, focused on how to sell rather than cut, um, what customers really need to help them to actually purchase a product. By bringing multiple channels together, connecting, connecting physical, online, and mobile interactions, brands can deliver consistent support of customer experiences across every touch point. We need to put the customer in the center of the shopping journey. And every interaction becomes an opportunity to create that brand awareness. The product is made available across all av um, avenues of the shopping journey, from discovery to research and to purchase. And it helps increase the likelihood that a customer will actually buy, no matter where they, they ultimately decide to do so. The third one is the supply chain uh, transformation. Now, this traditionally has been one of those points of contention. But according to KPMG's Nunwood 2018 Customer Experience Excellence Analysis Report, big mouthful. Logistics suppliers are widely regarded as the weakest link in the retail universe. The supply chain in retail needs to be more than a support function. It needs to be transformed to cover an end-to-end -end service from forecast to distribution. As a result, customer care has become a primary function within the overall retail supply chain. And the real opportunities lie with the retailers that offer superior customer service, from simple returns of online purchases, uh, ability to click and collect, and the ability to order online while in store when items perhaps are out of stock. The supply chain has become more complex than ever before. Interestingly, 79% of consumers want free return shipping, and that as many as 67% of shoppers check the returns page before they actually purchase online. 92% say they will buy again if returns are easy. And I think that becomes a lot more applicable these days because yeah, we're basically ordering a lot more online than we did before. And then of course, the global pandemic, uh, has now impacted these existing trends in, um, uh, and has disrupted and or exacerbated the pre-pandemic status quo. So what can we expect going forward? <clears throat> now, this is a very wordy slide. I've tried to highlight the most important statements from those paragraphs. First of all, the most agile retailers will win. Secondly, consumers are still spending more time at home. Even after we're starting to open up, we can see Europe and North America, you know, they're turning towards the lockdown again. Retailers should prepare for online penetration to remain raised in the aftermath of the crisis. So we basically crossed that little threshold where a lot of, the, um, you know, let's say prior years, people were still hesitant. They still like to go into, into the stores. Um, and I think that'll still be the case, but there's been a shift, there, a momentum shift towards people now being more comfortable with online shopping. Um, and that means that it'll remain raised, even though it may come down, come down a little bit in the coming months and years. And then obviously marketing will focus more on the personal health and well-being. So we see that a lot. Um, everybody mentions the, you know, social distancing and all of that uh, as part of the marketing strategies. Then again, another very wordy slide. And I try to um, highlight the important points. Short-term strategies uh, that retail can use for mitigation. Maintain engagement with customers through websites, social media, and live streaming. So we know that, we know um, we're all turning digital and that's sort of almost like a stepping stone towards uh, artificial intelligence as part of this, uh, uh, this presentation of this session. And then a midterm one to three years, accelerate investment um, and development of digital transformation across the businesses, advance research into accelerated changes in consumer behavior and reviewing store presence and reinforcing multi-channel alignment between physical and online with applicable. And then obviously that goes in uh, into long term as well. And this is from the Global Data COVID-19 cross sector impact report. And we can see that being realized, we can see just, uh, I just took a couple of screen grabs from a couple of articles uh, over the last, you know, recent months. And we can see that being reported, digital transformation, top of mind, COVID-19 accelerating Africa's uh, digital transformation agenda, accelerated digital transformation of businesses. These are all surfacing to the top as companies realize that we have to move that way in order to make the most of enhanced or advanced technologies in the first hand. And secondly, also just because we have, if we do that, then it enables us or it opens the door for us to be able to work from home as an employee, as an example. So another report, Twilio COVID-19 digital engagement report. Okay, this is UK specific, but I think it is applicable to our um, South Africa as well. COVID-19 was the digital accelerant of the decade. And I think that's sort of like a, well, 
not really an understatement, but it's definitely hitting the mark. Previous inhibitors to innovation have broken down. Digital communication is a new lifeblood of business. Um, and then digital technologies have opened up definite future remote work opportunities. Now, again, there's a lot of uh, jargon or rather a lot of percentages in here, but specifically to the retail industry, uh, while for retail and healthcare businesses, it was 69% um, of those businesses reported that they have definite future remote work opportunities. Now, obviously, this is not applicable to in-stores, but we can see that being a greater focus going forward. Right, and we can see the large brands responding. Um, again, okay, these are mostly global brands, um, but all of them are responding with extended or even in one or two cases, I think almost a permanent option to work from home going forward. So that digital platform, digital work from home capabilities are definitely uh, gaining momentum. And we can also see them uh, responding not just to the employees, but also to the customers, giving them augmented reality, also obviously using uh, that, which is almost like a subsection of, of artificial intelligence, IKEA. I mean, you can virtually see what a, a furniture piece will look like in your own living room and then order that. Amazon, perhaps, you know, seeing what uh, makeup would look on you as a person specifically. Nike, seeing the suit, uh, this is a big bugbear of myself. I can never order online because I'm never sure what, if Nike's 9.5 size shoe size is the same as Adidas. So that's very important. Um, and then another one uh, will be Parker, where you can see what you would look like in glasses. Again, you want to try those on in store, but these days you want to stay away from the stores. Well, I suppose not really, but it makes it easier to do from home. And then, of course, just other platforms. WhatsApp um, opens up in-app shopping now, uh, joining Facebook's e-commerce push for small businesses. 7-Eleven, uh, I suppose, mostly overseas, as delivery providers, a small basket e-commerce accelerates. And, of course, every shop, which is uh, seeing that they can com compete with take a lot in our local market, uh, backed by JD Group, um, which will be interesting uh, to see when they come online. Right. And then, of course, the South African online retail industry, uh, the market grew by 40% during COVID-19 lockdown and 2020 sees a boom for online shopping. So uh, again, this just reinforces what we basically know, but it's good just to see that we, when we think about it, we, you know, it's not just us thinking about it, it's being recognized in the market. Right, so going a little bit faster now, I think we're running, without running out of time. So going back to numbers, just to give you a visual indication of what that means when we say it's increased. So April, you'll see April's in the orange bars, Take a lot, better buy it one day, one day only, just as a snapshot. We can see how in May, the online visitors to these, um, to these sites or to these providers, how that increased. 134% average increase for Take a Lot over the last few months. Better buy 50%, one day only 74%. So we know that a lot more people are hitting our online um, presence. And these are obviously just the big names. Um, but that would be any company that has a digital presence or some kind of ability for a customer to go online and purchasing it. Because we know customers, if I normally go and go to a certain shop to buy my whatever product I want to buy, I would normally go first to see online if they have an online presence and I will buy it again from that first, from that company if they have it. Otherwise I'll go to migrate to the other platforms. And that's an 85.9% uh, average increase across those sites. But, but there's a problem because of this influx, the abandonment rate's gone up. So when we talk about shopping cart abandonment, I think we can almost say it's not just shopping cart, you're, you're, you're basically abandoning your customer because once they've moved from your digital footprint and they find what they were looking for at another provider, more than likely next time they're going to go to the other, the, the new provider, the next time they're looking for something. So it's very important. We can see over the last decade that the abandonment has gone up you know, let's say steadily, 2020, it's jumped up uh, by at least 10, uh, 10 to 15% uh, as opposed to 2019. And I guess that's um, almost, uh, almost expected because a lot of more people are going online that might not have previously done that and are not as au fait with going online as other people have. And just secondly, just the range of choices they have. No longer just one provider, there's multiple providers so they can hop around and look for the best deal. And we can see on the right-hand side, um, the retail side, it's about 84.51%, according to Statista. But secondly, when they come to your site, they only stay there for less than six minutes. These are international brands, um, mostly. 
well, the, this sheet or this slide has international brands on there. You can see people don't stay long on those websites. On average, basically less than six, six minutes. And if you look at the local, local, um, platforms, very, very similar, less than seven minutes, very close. So if you look at all of these data points, what does that actually mean? It means that we have a very short window of timing to try and influence your, the customers that come to your web, uh, your, your digital presence, very short window of time to actually um, get the business outcome that you are looking for as a, as a retailer, but also providing the customer with the options they were looking for. You've got a very short window of time to do that in. So this is where specifically where Genesis comes into the picture. So we have a solution to this problem called Genesis Predictive Engagement, which is powered by Genesis AI. Um, our solution is to help you through practical application of AI, leveraging customer journey data and engagement technology to firstly analyze and qualify the visitors being uh, buying intent through real-time analysis of the activities that they're doing on your digital presence. Then predict the buying, their buying interest to determine the most appropriate offer and action. So depending on what they're doing, what is the most appropriate action? Should we just leave them because they're doing what we want them to do? Or are they diverting from the journey that we want or the outcome that they want, we want them to achieve and therefore try to engage them or shape their journey? Thirdly, identify the perfect moment to engage via the most effective channel. So don't interject the journey if they're on the journey already, but if you see them abandoning the cart or not fulfilling in the form or sitting too long, then engage. And lastly, well, not lastly, I suppose, the fourth component being the missing piece to the puzzle. So the current, there's a, a plethora of marketing platforms out there that's really good at what they do. Adobe, uh, Salesforce, Google, all of them do a really good job at what they uh, at marketing. So the marketing being you go look at it uh, at a product and then you go to Facebook and then all of a sudden you see the same type of products in your Facebook feed. That's all part of the marketing technology stack trying to give you what you are looking for, what the those marketing platforms uh, are determining that you are interested in. That's really good, but there's one missing piece and that's the engagement with the, uh, tied into the artificial intelligence, the option for the customer to engage with your skilled, correctly skilled agent on the one hand or pre presenting them with a virtual agent, i.e. chatbot or, or voicebot, whatever the case might be. And when you get all of this together and also providing the context to the agent, remember when I was speaking about experiences of service, empowering the agent with the information they need in order to provide that empathy and showing the customer that you know them. When you get all of that right, that means that you reach the best possible outcome through the meaningful real-time engagement. And of course, that needs more conversions. But so just a quick case study. Um, it's one that I've mentioned before, but it's a really good one. Ethiopian Airlines, um, they've been using, and of course we know the airline industry was hit pretty hard. Here's a quote from the, the CIO. Genesis Predictive Engagement is enabling us to capture significantly more, significantly more window shoppers on our website. Conversion rates rose by 14% in the first two weeks and by 49% at the six week stage. And we're, we've only really scratched the surface of what the tool can do. So just, that just um, underlines what AI can help you do um, on existing websites. They didn't just deploy Genesis Predictive Engagement because they transformed digitally, they went into the cloud and the Genesis Cloud as a platform with Genesis AI, they see results or increased better results across the board. 25% increase in service level, 60% faster call response, 17% fewer abandoned calls. But the two most important to this topic is the 49% increase in website sales conversations and 72% reduction in website dwell time. So just talking to the effectiveness of the platform. And of course, I suppose one summary that can sum, sum it up pretty well, effective pandemic response without adding headcount, whilst increasing sales and enhancing customer experience. And you'll see um, that URL at the bottom there, if you want to quickly take a snip screen or a photo, that's where you can get the customer story if you wanted to. Right, now, um, Eddie, I'm not sure I'm jumping in here or, or uh, I'm not sure how much time I've got left. I've been rambling on. Um, I'd like to show the, 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 the platform quickly. Um, to the audience if that's okay. I need about five minutes. Uh, no, please go ahead. That's perfect. Okay. So the protagonist here is Peter. Peter is a com uh, company has implemented a work from home policy. Concerned about frequent visits to the grocery store, Peter is looking for a safer, more efficient way of providing for his family. He's got two concerns. The price has to be right. With financial pressures, uh, pressures rising, Peter wants a cost-effective convenient solution. Solution. Yeah. Solution. And safety. So Peter's primary concern is safety. He also suffers from a nut allergy. 
he needs to ensure that the food he orders is nut free, something easily achieved previously from reading the label products of products in store. So now he's doing it online and he's not sure whether um, the food he's ordering for his family is actually allergy friendly, if you will. So I'm going to switch to my web page. Let me just get there over here. Right. So Peter's been browsing around um, on the internet. So uh, hopefully you guys can see my Gmail. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll assume you can. <laughs> Um, so he's been browsing around because of that. He was added to a marketing campaign driven by those, those nice platforms like Adobe and, and all of that. He gets a marketing email and he opens it up and he sees it's a marketing, a quick marketing campaign or marketing email from a company called Cloud to Table, which does online food ordering, um, which he's actually looking at doing. So he's obviously his interest is peaked. So he goes ahead and clicks on that marketing, uh, campaign label, if you will. And that gets him to the site. Now, this is all good. He sees the site and it looks pretty nice. Um, we can look at the plans. Um, and now he's, you've successfully gotten him to your footprint. But now what do we do? So let's quickly look at under the hood of what Genesis Cloud is actually doing. Oops, no, no, wait, hold on. Back to that screen. All right, so this is Genesis Cloud. Um, the platform where we're actually running that AI from. Yeah. Just logging in so you can see it's actually a real platform. Right, it's a cloud platform built natively on top of Amazon Web Services. So if you think about uh, Netflix, basically using the same technology, the microservices in Amazon. So it gives you the, the scalability and the compute that you need in order to run it. And also the AI benefits the AI side of things. So just getting back to the topic of discussion, if I go to the predictive engagement section on the platform and I go to right now, I will be able to see, hopefully in a second, what Peter is doing actually on the website. So now, firstly, because we don't know, we, he hasn't logged in or identified himself, we can see he's unknown, but he's, he went to plans and we can see he got from the Get Cooking campaign. Now that marketing email that he opened, it's got UTM parameters tied to it. So that's normally what marketing campaigns do. So if you click on anything, any link on Google, on Facebook, and you go to the site, it has UTM parameters and that identifies the traffic as being belonging to a specific campaign. So this helps marketers and, and, and marketing to understand and attribute the, um, the visits to a specific marketing campaign. And that segmentation is done based on that UTM parameter. But importantly, what I wanted to show you is we can see, okay, went to cloud to table. A cooking campaign and he went to the plans page. So let me just get to back to the cloud to table side of things. So he look it looks very nice to him. See what he's going to do is he's going to log on, he's going to create an account. One of those reasons why people abandoned apparently. So he's going to log in. Let me just log into the site. Okay. So he says he wants to have with meat. It's for four people in his family. He wants uh, four, maybe not Fridays, just Monday to Thursday. He looks at it and he says, great, get cooking. Now keep an eye on the right-hand side as we're actively tracking what's happening. We're seeing that he's added protein, people, and weekly. So he's got his email address, name. That all looks good to him, perhaps be filled. And he goes, continue. Now, the moment he does that, we can see that being submitted, if you choose to, but then also we're tying that, that's updated. He's no longer an unknown visitor. We now know who he is. We know some information where he's browsing from. Um, at this point, we don't know the desktop. He's using a Chrome browser. It's a Windows NT machine, a Windows machine. And the outcome, this is the AI running. So this is the probability of him actually doing a food subscription, increasing as he carries down the path that he's on. Now, he's really just at the checkout page. So on the checkout page, all he now needs to do is fill in his card number, credit card number, and go check out. And that's exactly the point where we see the drop off happening. So I am going to, let me just go, oops, let me just go back here. One moment. Right, so I'm just, as an agent, I'm 
basically logging in as an agent on the platform, waiting for that interaction. So Peter now just needs to complete the checkout, but now what he does, he's not sure. Remember, he has a nut allergy, so he's not sure whether the food contains nuts. So he wants to go and look for something um, in the back end to see if he can find any information regarding that. So he browses around. In the meantime, what's happened, let me just show you before I pick that up. You see this chat offer coming up? The reason for that being is he's abandoned that checkout. Now, normally you would get an email a day, the day after, say, hey, you've left something in your cart. Um, but in this case, remember, we can see Peter. That is the outcome. Because the, I'll see the outcome there, it, it went up to about 90%. And because it decreased by, let's say, 50%, the probability went down. That's why we're now engaging. We're not engaging according to a static rule. We're engaging based on the AI um, uh, outcome probability. So he says yes. He wants to start engaging with the, uh, with an agent, and he goes to start chat, and we can see that happening um, in real time there. Now, <laughs> okay, so that didn't help. Let me try to do that again. Okay. So a chatbot answers him so he can get some information, but he just wants to speak to the, to the agent, right? And the agent answers it. Right, so first of all, he can see what happened to, the, um, to that discussion from the chatbot, so the agent's be able to see what happened there. But very importantly, being able to show empathy is very key. So the agent has access to that journey. So instead of answering with, hey, how can I help you? First, he can say, you can answer him on his name and you can see the chat, but you can also see that web, the web visit that he was on. So you can see he got from the campaign, he was abandoned. You can see he added to the cart. He added all of the, um, the information to or the journey that he took on the website, the cooking campaign. We can see the outcome went down. It went up and went down and then he threw it to chat. So the agent's able to answer him immediately. And I'm almost done. I know we're running out of time, right? So he can he can do that with the customer. And then the last point I just wanted to show you as part of this is you don't have to just use AI in a certain way. So for instance, just when to engage, you can also use AI to assist the agent, depending on what the customer is communicating to you with you. So now apologies for the squash, squashed screens. But if I go here and I say, um, uh, as a customer, I have a nut allergy uh, is, for instance, is your food allergy free, as an example. Now the moment it, the AI picks up, it does a search against the knowledge base and finds the most um, pertinent articles or knowledge information for the agent. So the agent can just click into there, see if it actually matches what he is looking for, right? And he looks at it and says, great, Dale, that, that looks fine. That looks exactly what um, the agent is looking for. Perhaps the top one, you go send to chat directly. You can answer the agent. The customer's happy, says, thank you. So he's happy with the nut allergy stuff and what that would mean to him, great. So he goes down and he goes to his cart. Now in the meantime, the agent can see what's happening. And he goes to the checkout and hopefully the submits. We can see that happening again in real time. It's updating as he's submitting the order. And he's done that and we're all happy. We've helped the customer with this nut allergy question. We can see the probability went up. We've achieved the outcome. Remember the outcome I was talking about? So the outcome was we wanted the subscription from him. He's submitted the subscription. We've helped him with AI and showed empathy. And therefore we've achieved our business outcome. All right. Now, go back there. There's demonstration and that's me. So I will be, uh, going to the tables after this, into those chat room tables, uh, if somebody wanted to discuss anything, but let me handle, I think I've used more than enough time already. I think I've probably gone over, so I'll stop sharing and um, yeah, we can take it from there.
No, thank you, Peter. Um, really appreciate it. I, just, um, I can quite confidently tell you that I'm not one of your six-minute average shoppers, shoppers. I'm definitely somebody pulling the average up a bit. And I'm also definitely not an abandoned cart kind of person. Um, but let's move on to Gary Alleman, the MD of Master Data Management. He's going to be talking about why data integrity is critical in preparing for AI. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. I think uh, hopefully my talk will carry on quite nicely from Peter's. A number of the examples he used um, are examples that I'm going to touch on as well. Um, but I think where I'm hopefully going to differentiate a little bit is I'm going to speak a little bit more around the analytics um, side for uh, for AI and where analytics can be useful in retail. And some of these examples, um, you know, Peter touched on them, omni-channel and real-time marketing. Um, those are two different things. I stuck them together onto one line just to, to make the slide simpler. But that's really an opportunity that a lot of us are working on. Um, but one that, that I found really quite fascinating talking to, to our partners internationally is, is the whole concept of halo forecasting. And that's talking about the reality that, that bricks and mortar shopping drive online sales. So there's a relationship between online sales and the proximity of bricks and mortar, mortar outlets. Um, so that's another area where artificial intelligence and analytics play quite an important role. And then clearly, you know, looking at site locations, where to, where to locate a store, is it going to be a, a profitable location, and competitor analysis, where are competitors shopping? Um, you know, site, site location goes to my retail outlets, but it's also important as we move into electronic shopping um, for distribution and, and for delivery. So I need to understand from an from a electronic shopping perspective where to locate my warehouses and, and how I'm going to, to service my customers. And then the last area, which I think Peter also touched on quite nicely, is the whole area of personalized shopping and understanding, you know, what to recommend uh, to customers um, based on what they're doing. There's quite interesting research. Customers have indicated they're 110% more likely to add additional items to their, ba their baskets and 40% more likely to spend more than they had planned when the shopping experience is highly personalized. So this is a real area of opportunity um, for retail, and it's an area where I think we're seeing a lot of investment. Um, but for what, really what I want to touch on is the dependency on, on location intelligence. I'm not going to read um, read all the, the, the questions here, but a lot of the information, a lot of the data that we need, you know, there's a combination of the internal shopping data. We know we know what our customers are doing. Hopefully some of us, depending on the retailer, might have detailed customer information. That's one of the big reasons why we invest in loyalty programs is to allow us to start to understand who our shoppers are. Others might be dependent on, on the, the means of purchase. So I might have a credit card number, but I don't have a lot of detail about the individual shopper. Um, we want to be able to take that shopping information. We want to be able to take our basket information. And we want to be able to link that into um, the, the location information that allows us to understand where should we be uh, distributing uh, our stores, et cetera. You know, where, where should we be locating stores? Where should we be locating our warehouses and our distribution our outlets? Can we deliver to the location in the, in the agreed time frames? Can we meet our SLAs? These are all location type questions. So what I want to touch on next, I want to just play a short video um, talking about the differentiator in the, in, the, in the data. The differentiated value proposition is not in the algorithm. It's actually in the data. The algorithms will be open source. I don't know if you've seen data scientists or machine learning people in the but they're typically sitting in Jupyter or Zeppelin, typing in Python commands in these notebooks and then immediately seeing classifier or visualization. It's pretty cool, right? Um, but these algorithms themselves, the neural networks, they're, they're open source. Uh, uh, Google actually acquired Kaggle, right, which is all about open sourcing the models on certain data science problems. So you're not going to differentiate yourself with the models. You're going to differentiate yourself with the proprietary training data that you actually feed into the model. Why do you think Google has been buying data acquisition companies for years for a lot of money? Why do you think Google makes all these weird devices, like this backpack that scans and treats on 
are that has, they're just for nest, right? Uh, the 1984 spy cam that you put in your your house, that sort of stuff. They do this so they can actually get proprietary data that is making your own. Right, so Stan uh, Christians is the, C, the chief technical officer of Calibra, and they're one of the leading data management companies worldwide and a partner of ours. And this is really backing up research that's showing repeatedly, you know, the training data that you feed into your algorithms, the training data that, um, that you use to define uh, your, your, your models is far more important than the, than, the, than the actual algorithm that you use, where, in effect, uh, oopsie, um, where in effect the algorithms are, are public domain, you can go onto the uh, the internet and buy them. So the differentiator for artificial intelligence is data. One of the things we see in, as a major inhibitor to the adoption of art artificial intelligence for analytics is this, is the is the lack of trust in data from the executives and the lack of understanding or the inability to audit the data model and how that model is making decisions based on the training data. Stan uses the phrase bias is like a snake in the data grass. So what does bias mean? It means that the data, the quality of the data we're working with is no longer good enough to be looking at completeness and, and, and some of these, these, these old, older or sort of established uh, data quality metrics. We also have to look at how decisions were being made in the past using this data, and we need to train the models to make the decisions that we want the models to make rather than the, 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 the decisions that the models may have made Past. So an example of that might be saying, well, you know, is it going to be more profitable to have a store location in Sandton City or in Soweto, Soweto as an example? And based on historical uh, data, we may uh, argue that, you know, Sandton City is the, is the logical place to put, to put our new store. But what we're seeing is a change, a shift in, in, in people's movements and their shopping behavior based on COVID-19 that's really turning... Uh, turning this, these, these old biases upside down, and we need to start to make decisions based on what's happening today rather than what was happening in the past. Um, very briefly, I want to touch on finding data as a people and process problem. So I know that when, when I mention the word data, we talk about data, very often business people, you know, their eyes glaze over, they want to throw the discussion over to IT. But increasingly, you know, data is, it's captured by, by business people, it's used by business people for decision making, and business, data literacy is, is one of the emerging capabilities that executives need to, you know, to, to uh, develop. But also, we need to start to develop data literacy and, and these capabilities more broadly in the organization, because this is a shared responsibility between uh, the business people and the data people. Um, and what that means is that data should have its own business processes, just like we have a, a process for, for finance, we have a process for procurement. We also need to start treating data as an asset to, start to understand how we're doing that more effectively. Very briefly, there's this old saying when it comes to data that says garbage in, garbage out. And really what that's, what that's proving is that uh, with COVID-19, you know, there's, there's retailers that have been around for 20 or 50 or 100 years that have amassed huge amounts of data. They understand buying patterns, they understand location, they understand which stores are profitable, which products are profitable in which locations. But there's been a reset that, that we are still all learning to grapple with that's making it really easy or much easier for new entrants to enter into the market and compete because those buying patterns have shifted to such an extent that, that almost everybody now is starting from, from uh, step zero. So really, very briefly, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking technical, but I just wanted to, for the non-technical users out there and maybe for the IT people, when we think about artificial intelligence or advanced analytics, or very often as a business user, all I'm interested in is the reports at the end of the day. I want to understand the, um, the insights. I want to understand the reports. I, I might want to have, to have the expert explain the report and the, and the conclusions from that. But what we very often forget is that there's a lot of, info, a, a lot of work that needs to happen before um, a report or before an, a, an AI model can be delivered that adds value. So you know, at a very high level, yeah, that there's a bunch of BS capabilities that need to be put into place. I might need somewhere to store the data in terms of a data warehouse or a data lake. There's a bunch of processes that, that um, IT needs to, to deliver in order to um, make the data available to me and to do it in a secure way, you know, particularly as we now start to work um, with customer data and, and we start to, to see um, Poppy, uh, you know, having now finally come into play. Um, data security is an issue. We need to make sure the right data is shared, but but with the right people. I'm not going to talk through all of these areas. 
And then from a business perspective, we really need to understand the data. We need to ensure it's being used appropriately. And we need to be able to understand that we can trust the data. So there are, there are a lot of IT disciplines and data management disciplines that come into play to deliver trusted data. Um, really, the last couple of slides I want to talk to is the, is the data integrity slide. And, what, and this is coming from one of our international partners precisely. And what they've done based on market research is that they've really uh, you know, gone to markets with, with the big uh, international Fortune 500 players. And they've identified this capability in the market called data integrity, which is talking about bringing together internal and externally sourced curated or trusted data in order to give you the best possible experience. And in this case, what you know, the, the one area I want to touch on is the location experience data, where we're talking about bringing together demographic data. We're talking about bringing together customer movement data so we can trace movements of customers um, and feeding that data in to augment our existing data sets that we know you know, this customer, they used to move into Sandton uh, between 8 o'clock and 5 o'clock every day during the week. Now they, they're staying in four ways. So their movement pattern has shifted and therefore their shopping behavior has also shifted. And some of that information comes from mobile trace. Some of that information comes from social media and other areas. But we use that information to augment um, and enrich our existing internal data sets and bring them up to date and really help to produce uh, data that has integrity, which means... It's accurate, it's consistent, and it has context. We understand what this means within the, within the environment and related to our data sets. Um, and then I'm going to finish just with a little bit about us. Um, we've been in this data space for about 20 years, nearly 15 years, more than 15 years. Um, and our focus is around these fundamentals, and people sometimes glaze over a little bit. But if we don't put the fundamentals in place, what we find is that the, the you know the big the big strategic projects fail because the, the underlying data that's fed into them is not trustworthy uh, and, and and you know business doesn't doesn't re react to the to the uh, insights and the recommendations coming from the the BR or the AI team. What's interesting to understand now as well is that when we when we start hitting artificial intelligence, we then start also running into the the complexity that could the consumer doesn't trust the model. So we run into potential legal challenges around decisions and recommendations made um, where if we can't prove how or we can't, we don't have some kind of audit capability that shows how um, a model was making a decision or a recommendation, we can open ourselves to, up to liability and to risk. So this is really the area that we play is, is trying to help businesses to solve those underlying products and deliver the data that, the, you know, then the genesis and the other teams can use uh, for the clever stuff. Um, and last but not least, you know, integrity creates trust. So you wouldn't do business as a rule uh, with somebody that you didn't trust. You wouldn't marry somebody that you didn't trust. And the same challenge applies to data. You know, if we, if we don't have data that has integrity, we can't trust the data. And then that stops us from getting the value from AI. Um, thank you very much. And I'm available for questions either now or uh, later on in the day. Thank you so much, Gary. Appreciate it. Good, so um, our last speaker, and then we will move on to the Q&A session, is Yugesh Freilink, the Chief Experience Officer at the CX Group. Um, Yugesh supposedly is obsessed with custom with their customer experience and is recognized as one of the top CS, CX experts in South Africa. And today she's gonna to be talking about AI and VR and its impact to the customers and the organization's experience. So, Yugesh. Sure, thank you so much, Claire. Uh, just a quick hello so that you know that there's a human behind the screen. Uh, I am gonna put my video off now uh, so that it can save a bit of bandwidth. Uh, so I hope this is right. Um, yeah, so I think um, I am, uh, just a quick, uh, you know, what I do, uh, I am CEO and Chief Experience Officer of the CX Group. And we're a company that helps uh, clients through uh, designing and setting up their customer experience strategies, as well as uh, coaching, training their customer experience management teams uh, through to the implementation of the innovation and the smart things that teams uh, uh, together can come up for um, to, to enhance customers' uh, experiences. So uh, with regards to um, my topic today, I want to speak to us about AI within the world of CX. And I'd like to start with uh, sharing with you 
Firstly, what is the purpose of business? So the purpose of business is to create value that matters to customers and that he or she is willing to pay for because it improves his or her life. And I think that's often a statement that we overlook uh, when we get caught up with the technology and the great things that it can do for us. The next uh, thing that I'd like us to go into is let's understand what AI actually is. For all of us that are not that tech driven, artificial intelligence refers to the simu simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. The term may also be applied to any machine that exhibits traits associated with a human mind, such as learning and problem solving. And I think Steve Jobs says it the best when he says, what a computer is to me, it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with that it's, and it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. And a key statement, you know, the key things that I take out of these three statements is one, let's not forget that we've got a customer at the end of, the, at the end of this entire experience that we, we are designing, and he's going to have to follow through um, this experience that you're designing for uh, him for. The, the second thing is that we are using machines in order to enable us to become smarter and it's a bicycle for our mind. So just to, in order to frame where AI is, AI is not something that's going to take over the world. AI is not something that is going to take our jobs and we're not going to have uh, robots as leaders. AI is an enabler in order to help us as human beings become smarter in the way that we deliver experiences to our customers. So let's have a look at the AI dichotomy and what's, what's happening in the world right now. So key um, uh, statements from Wall Street to Forbes are saying things like, why every company is a technology company today. Every company is now a tech company, whether they like it or not. Um, banks are tech companies that move digital money around the globe. Insurers are tech companies employing data science for advanced modeling. And food producers are even uh, you know, classed within the techno becoming technology companies because of the biotechnology and the gene splicing techniques that they that are built by software for seeds and eventually for them to get the produce to the to the shelves that we uh, pick the products up from. So the 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 key thing is to understand that every company is becoming a technology company, whether you like it or not. So so uh, more reasons why. Uh, companies are becoming technology companies is, is that, you know, I'm not going to read the entire list here, but some call outs for me that are important is new generations expect technology focused uh, te uh, companies, digital first com customers demand intuitive uh, technology. And if you think about yourself as well, when you go through to a site or you go on an online activity or you use an app, you are expecting a certain level of intuitiveness built into the product. And if that doesn't happen, you abandon very early in your uh, journey with, um, with that particular brand. Business growth isn't possible without technology. We know that the competitor is doing it. We know that customers are getting exposed across brands, across industries to technology. So there's no doubt that they are expecting the same levels of um, uh, technology exposure from um, uh, from you when they when they uh, interact with you. The other th the other statement that's interesting for me here is customers expect service related technology. So when something goes wrong with my experience, I don't always want to pick up a phone and speak to somebody. I want assistance, but I also want choices as to when I want to speak with somebody um, telephonically, when I want to dial a number, or would I rather have an in chat uh, facility to speak with somebody whilst I, I am in the process of doing something with the brand. And then agility defines competitiveness. We all know that we have to keep ahead and we have to be constantly looking through uh, the windscreen forward to the future plans and predicting what customers are potentially going to need. And no longer is the review mirror required for us to um, um, move forward or for us to keep our focus on. Another important thing that I thought I'd speak about is the hype cycle. And let's look at what happened in 2017 with regards to the hype cycle. We're currently going through a similar 
cycle from an AI perspective, um, where expectations start from the innovation side uh, all the way through to very, very high expectations. And we get a whole lot of technologies being thrown at us as a consumer, as well as employees sitting in um, in corporations that are wanting to uh, focus on digit, um, AI digital strategies. And at some point when we were busy with the rise of AI, we started hearing things like smart workspaces, edge computing, smart robots, virtual assistants. And then suddenly there was a dip in what AI could do and couldn't do. And eventually what you see is that expectations start to plateau where people, the hype is over and we now start looking at, okay, so where is the responsible ways and the realistic ways of applying this technology in our everyday um, uh, work environments for the customer experiences? So a couple of things that we learned, we've um, we've seen seen from tech providers and forgive me because there are tech providers in the in the, um, the the you know the audience as well as our speakers but sometimes tech providers are romantic about technology only so from an ai everywhere perspective we started talking about smart robots we started talking about conversational UI, uh, user interfaces artificial general intelligence from a transparently uh, immersive experiences we were talking 4d printing com uh, brain computer interfaces um, virtual reality uh, human augmentation and from a digital platform perspective, we were looking at things like 5G, edge computing, block uh, blockchain, IoT platforms. And yes, some of this exists, and most of this exists, but in very small pockets. But as tech, as uh, people become more familiar with what AI is capable of, we start seeing that disseminate and expectations low, um, um, sort of simmer down based on uh, the hype, based on us getting over the hype. But my key question to all of this hype that speak, the way we speak about all of this technology and AI and all of these great things that can happen, have where is the customer in all of this tech talk? And my, um, my, I'm hoping to help you realize that we are at hearts wanting to be smart and innovative. We want to be the competitor. We want to be the first to be on the platform to do things. But we must always realize and lead from where, what the customer actually needs. In order for us to, so I, I loved Gary's talk as well, where he's speaking about data is king. You are as smart as the data that you can collect within your organization. And as soon as you're able to lift the data of a spreadsheet to tell a story, you start having the right conversations around the customer and around what tech can be used to enable um, the experiences that we're trying to create uh, for the customer. The next uh, sl slide I want to speak about was, uh, you know, if, if you do have some time, listen to Elon Musk's um, warnings about artificial intelligence, where he spoke, he was interviewed in 2018 uh, at the CXCW event, where he was talking about super digital intelligence right now is very dangerous for humanity, because we don't understand it in its entirety, to be able to just let it out there and start doing what it needs to do in the true sense of what I, AI was born to do. And a couple of the guys uh, that we see as leaders in um, from a global perspective did try to go out into the AI space and play in this world. And you would what they found was things that they could not explain and things that they couldn't understand very quickly, that they had to shut down those uh, instances of AI and come up with more meaningful ways for their customers to engage with the abilities um, and the enablement that artificial intelligence can introduce into our lives in this day and age as consumers. Have a look at Google. Um, we, we all know that uh, Google created its own um, 
child AI that is more advanced than systems built by human beings. Um, we, we heard about the fact that uh, GNMT was less than a month old when Google's AI researchers realized that the program created its own language, which was not, pro which was not programmed to do. So yes, the technology has done some immensely impressive things, but it actually has not, uh, it wasn't invented for the uh, realistic requirements that we needed them to, uh, we needed to achieve for, for customers. Another example was Facebook, where Facebook um, researchers shut down their AI uh, that they invent, where it invented their entire their own language, and they also invented a partner. The AI uh, technology created its own partner where they were having their own conversation using the English language, but not using it in the way that we would understand it. So in actual fact, they created their own languages. They, they created their own English language where the human beings could not understand what is being said between the two AI um, um, pieces of uh, or bots that were created. Um, <clears throat> talking about um, Alpha Zero AI beats champions, champion chess programmers after teaching itself in four hours. Now that's an immensely incredible piece of information or piece of technology that's been built. Think about what it can do for our lives, for it to be more meaningful. Becoming a chess champion takes hours and a lifetime of experience and a lifetime of games in order for human beings to become chess champions. Um, and, and for, for, for them to have created something called Alpha Zero that was able to learn the game and become and beat champions in less than four hours can tell you how powerful the technology is and how machine learning can enable systems to do far much more remarkable things than we can ever think of. So another question that people have been asking and uh, with with uh, some of us that have children in schools, we're starting to ask the questions of: Are we being teach? Are we teaching our children the right things at school? Are we having the right? Um, you know, are we directing children to have the right conversations? Are we enabling our children to do the right jobs? And the the the. The research has shown that as much as artificial intelligence is going to enable us to a point where um, we have not yet understood it, it's not going to take the child, your children's jobs away. It is going to enable them. And another fact to know is that technology is not going to eliminate jobs. It, it's, 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 technology eliminates jobs, but not work. There will still be a requirement for a human being to be there. However, the way we choose to do our work is not going to be based in the industrial age, um, uh, linear lean process methodologies and, and exposure that we all have, um, we've been exposed to in our lives, but it is going to enhance um, what we do and how we do it. And we're going to be uh, the people sitting at the back of this that's going to um, uh, be enabled by the smart uh, AI technology. So um, the last thing that I wanted to speak, uh, well, not the last, the last article that I wanted to show you here was about you know, if AI is all, all that we've experienced it to be, if AI is everything that we have seen it to be, um, and AI can outperform doctors, why don't patients trust it? So that in itself will say to you that from a human being perspective, from a uh, consumer perspective, we are not ready for that at this moment in time. Um, so, Maybe we have dived into AI in certain instances from a global perspective. Maybe we've dived into AI um, because we're caught up in the hype. We want to experience and we, we, want, we want to experience and get onto the bandwagon. Um, or are we, or do we see an internal opportunity that allows the, the responsible use of AI in your environment to enhance the customer experience? So we talk about, um, you know, a uh, the concept of strategic gifting, and often it's you know the tech 
industry's shiny problematic toy do we bring it into our environment and start using it and start testing it or do we need to first take a hold of what we're doing what we want to achieve what does the customer need and then from there decide how ai is going to play in our space and the recipe for that is to first start understanding your customer customer experience you cannot make a way you cannot decide um, upfront that you are going to uh, follow through on um, uh, uh, an AI project without understanding what it is that you are trying to achieve uh, from a customer experience perspective and not just because it's a shiny new toy that's come through. Research also shows that when people were asked um, what was what people value the most in their customer experience. And you'll see that convenience rates very, very high on the uh, on the graph as as opposed to automation, which is quite low down on the graph. Please forgive me, I've got my dogs in the background. Um, when it comes to humans versus automation in the interaction, where customers were asked, um, the percentage who indicated i want to interact with a real person more as technology improves and 75 percent of people across the globe have agreed that i still do want to speak with a with a uh, um, a human being at the end of the experience at the end of or in my when i'm engaging with a brand what we what we try what i'm trying to show here is that customers still rate convenience up-to-date technology human interactions quite high as opposed to automation so but there is a place for automation within our world um and then i was speaking to if you wanted to go in with your ai technology you need to also not just think about what um the company um what what channel you want to integrate with with your client you need to consider the entire experience the client or the customer wants to uh, will engage with you right through from an online experience through to speaking to an agent either telephonically or on the um, um, uh, online and often what we do is that we implement a piece of technology in a particular uh, touch point and we rate the satisfaction in that channel and we say great guys we're doing 90 percent um uh, we've got a 90 percent satisfaction level from a web perspective we're doing perfectly or we're doing brilliantly but what we need to keep top of mind is that the customer has engagements across channels with you um and he is um he is getting uh, uh, a, a he's creating a perception of his experience with you across channels within the uh, within your organization. Then there are six hallmarks for best in practice, uh, best in class customer experience practitioners, um, a guide on how to use uh, um, AI in their world. And it's first to define the clear customer experience, the aspirations and the common purpose. The next is to uh, develop a deep understanding. And I suppose that is the work that Gary does in understanding what matters to the customer and inform the journey redesign then it's to understand the behavioral psychology to uh, manage the customer expectations and then at this point is when you start innovating your journeys and you start including your digital um, uh, expertise and the design thinking so it comes at a later point not forgetting the customer and this is why we're actually in this space at the moment we, we we're using ai not because it's a shiny new tool but we're using ai to enhance customer experiences so who's doing this well from a technology perspective to improve CX um, customer experience, Netflix is doing this well. If we think about the personalization that we have and the amount of information that's ch uh, channeled through to us that's customized, um, uh, Netflix uses AI to mine the data of its subscribers and provide highly personalized experiences to more than 180 million subscribers worldwide. The other guys that are doing it fairly well, if we think about Amazon Alexa, also known as uh, well, Amazon also known as Alexa, she's a virtual assistant, and we've all played and tried using Alexa, and it works out pretty well. We've also seen an integration between Amazon Alexa and using, um, you know, um, uh, 
uh, overseas using it for logging calls and logging problems that are happening on the roads. Um, as you drive past, you can also ask and log a problem with your local municipality as you drive through. And that's also been phenomenally successful. And then we also know Apple. Apple's virtual assistant Siri has now brought in uh, the iOS, the iPad, the watch uh, OS, the Mac OS, and the TV OS operating systems. So the status of AI from an implementation perspective and what's really happening within uh, companies Companies at this point in time is that you can see that 33% of them are still in the planning in the beginning phase of the journey of becoming um, more aligned and more uh, digitally aligned and uh, alignment to the, uh, the use of AI and what can happen within their spaces. Um, and only 9% of them right now are established in the practice of using AI um, in a way that is meaningful within their organizations. The challenges is to, uh, the, the, the top three that we can see there is building an internal culture to embrace the AI technology to uh, competing priorities. You know, another problem within the customer journey might be a problem. Do we want to invest in innovation and AI at this point in time? And the third is getting maximum value for the investment, investing in the technology and being able to reap the benefits and look at the ROI um, uh, in a significant manner to say, I've invested this 10 million and this is what it's brought me in the last six months is also something that is proving to be quite a challenge within the AI space. The opportunities are phenomenal. The opportunities that we are starting to see from a corporation perspective across industries is um, uh, chatbots and virtual assistants are starting to have more meaningful engagements with customers online. Empowering self-service, allow me to engage with your brand on my terms, providing, uh, providing you with technology and understanding customers better and faster through the data uh, and machine learning that we've got available to us has allowed us to become far much uh, smarter to offer better personalized um, experiences. So there's five habits for success for AI. One, use a mixed role of AI teams. Don't let all the techies get into a room and design a solution for your business. You've got to have a very um, uh, cross-functional team in that space whilst you are developing your AI solutions. Invest in a variety of mixed role teams and train them on AI if you need to in order for them to add to those workshops in a more meaningful way. The next thing is include top executives in the strategy and the funding. Let them understand what they're getting involved in. Let them understand what the uh, ROI is. Do AI with a purpose and measure it. You need to start measuring it from day one. And also limit the number of proof of concepts that you've got. Put in your proof of concept, let it work, and don't let it run for too long until you realize it's a fail. We, we often speak about fail fast and learn quickly. And that I, that I think is a key lesson out of working with the, uh, with the AI hype that's come up, that's, that's, uh, that's, um, we've experienced in the last couple of years, as well as where we're now and we've matured into where it is actually going to play a role for us for now. So know the implications. One, your customer have, has demands and they aren't what you think. You need to go out and find out what those are. You generate Customers generate revenue, employees drive the experience. So just in, as I started in the beginning talking about your customers are important, your employees are even more important. So getting the culture right within the organization to embrace the AI and let them understand what it is going to do for them is, is important. And the third thing is technology can't solve experience problems. It's only an enabler to getting the experience right with your business. So I'm um, sorry for the, the, the lack of slides in the beginning of the presentation. Please forgive me. That's my presentation. And I am so happy for the opportunity. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at, at, some, at any point. Thank you, Nikesh. I'm sorry, I should have said something a little bit earlier. It's cool. <laughs> 
Um, so now we are going to move on to our question and answer session. Um, we're going to be joy joined, the, the, our three speakers and myself are going to be joined by Lloyd Kumbemba, the CEO and founder of Bitcrack Cybersecurity, apologies, and Marius Buerta, the senior sales executive of FinChatBot. So if any, everybody, are we going to have everyone's um, microphones on and we are just going to check if there are any there's no questions in the <coughs> actual chat area so what I was wondering is we maybe um, approach a subject of like cyber security is AI quick enough to pick up you know with more companies moving online how do we you know where do we go with cyber security um, how effective will AI be in detecting and, and mitigating threats um, anyone want to take that as my first question? Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it. No, I'm not an expert on cyber security, but what I, what I do understand from an AI perspective is that the, the whole cyber security space is moving incredibly quickly. In other words, threat, threats, some new threats are emerging more quickly than people can keep up with it. And that's where the opportunity for AI comes into play um, because AI obviously can kind of, kind of, kind of pick up your AI behavior that looks suspicious that humans can't uh, under the scope to, to do. Um, I think it's not just the, the shopping online, it's the, it's, the, it's the working online as well. It's the whole cyber security space is definitely being uh, driven by the shift to digital that's been driven by COVID. So I'll stop at that. Anyone else want to comment? No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Lloyd? Right, I think uh, what the gentleman has alluded to is, is, is very important. It's one thing to have the AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, gadgets, so forth and so on. But the key thing is to secure these things. Because as, as, as the speaker alluded to, the fact that garbage in, garbage out. The moment when AI uses corrupt data is going to protect, is not going to give you a wrong output completely. So it is very important that when we are building these AI platforms and gadgets, there's need to think about cybersecurity because the moment we build up these good things, there are bad people that want to destroy them. And hence, uh, we need to be very careful because AI won't be meaningful. Um, without ensuring that the security behind the scenes and that uh, um, you know people utilize them with the proper data input so that they can realize uh, uh, the correct uh, uh, outcomes that they anticipate to have so and, 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 and for me that is very important that is key to to ensure that uh, we have uh, quality AI in terms of utilization and, and usage but especially where cyber security is concerned, you know, um, it's very important to make people understand that it's somebody's job to break in or get your information. You know, just like we do, or like now, I'm trying to do a good job presenting this um, conference. But what we're saying is somebody else's job is to get information or hack something and blah, 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 blah. So the difficulty is, you know, AI obviously, need, like you said, needs the appropriate data to be able to fight that threat. Indeed, indeed. And also one can use AI in two aspects. Um, as much as we can have like Siri, like all these uh, uh, AI platforms and so forth and so on. But one can also use AI to speed up the detection of hackers who are coming back to so you've got two uh, things to do because as, as, as the speaker alluded to, you know, technology cannot replace um, humans as much as it can speed up operational efficiency to do things faster. But in a sense, it requires us as humans to interact with it, so to speak. So we, we, we can use AI in both ways one is a cybersecurity tool to speed up, take up, take out these bad people, but as much as we can also use AI to enhance operational efficiency on the production floor in the in the in, in the household and things of that nature. 
But the key is for us to realize that technology, when we are building AI or M ML, machine language, we need to have this mind that someone is going to come and disrupt and destroy. And the moment when you've got that mindset, right from the beginning, right from the, from the, from the production floor, before a product is, is, comes out of the, the, the production line, then, then it, it's good. And, and, and from my experience, I must share this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are a cybersecurity company that operates throughout the world, in the UK, in the US, all over in the Southern Africa. A lot of people do not appreciate the fact that cybersecurity is very important. Their systems are unsecure. And believe you me, what I'm seeing on the happening on the marketplace is very bad because people do not take uh, sort of uh, cybersecurity very seriously. Hackers are taking advantage and they are milking these people with millions and millions of dollars in, in encryption, uh, sorry, in, in ransomware and all these things. So there is need to really take cybersecurity very seriously yeah. when we are using all these gadgets and so forth. So but now there's even, um, you know, a double reason. First of all, you know, ethically, you shouldn't be, you sh your, the information you have on people shouldn't be freely available to hackers or you should have the best security you possibly can. And secondly, you know, if, your, if information stored for clients or um, customers is released or is found, you know, you are now faced with a huge fine, which is also, I mean, it's, you know, astronomical amounts of money for, for being a bit tardy or not looking after your security properly, you know. Um, so I have a question here from Francisco. Is AI going to create jobs or take away people's jobs? So I have a whole new opinion about that, but I'm going to leave it to the experts. I know, Higesh, you spoke a little bit about it as well, didn't you? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think, Claire, from, uh, you know, we all thought that uh, tech is going to come through and we think about Robocop and we think about all of these fancy machines that are going to do what we do. I think it's not uh, going to take away jobs. It's going to allow us to start thinking differently and creating new jobs. Um, we, the way that we know workers, so if I sat for a week putting a report together before I went into a uh, management meeting to make decisions, I now have that report as a, an, at a click of a button and I even have a whole lot of predictability against that. I then start becoming smarter. It saves me time. I have far much, I spend time, more time having more meaningful conversations on solutioning and how to move forward and make lives, life better for the customer as opposed to spending a week putting the report together mm. and it's also what you referred to in like um sort of line working and you know i mean we are not built to to put things together you know everybody puts a lid on one you know on a bottle for instance we yeah. are not geared like our bodies are not made for that bringing mm -hmm. in machines or um, artificial intelligence to run those kinds of things is you know, it makes sense because it frees us up to do jobs that we're actually good at, you know, or built for or created for. I see Maurice yeah. is not eating. Um, agree? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I, I think it's going to transform people. I think it's going to free people up to do more human-like jobs, actually. Um, more no, their jobs as well, maybe. Exa exactly. I, I don't think anybody wants to do boring, repetitive work, actually. Um, I think there's there's probably going to be a, a, a more more jobs available. I think some jobs are going to become less relevant and less important. Like through all the revolutions in the past, industrial revolutions, you know, things change and and some jobs become less available and less important, whatever. Uh, but as a whole, I think it's, it's it's freeing up people to be more human and be more creative and actually, you know, you know take away the boring side of things actually and be more engaged in their work as well actually and, and we're problem solvers humans are supposed to you know look at i mean if you look at, Af at south africa specifically and all the entrepreneurships and all the thing all the problems we're trying to solve for us locally you know that's that's what humans are made for so if the machines can do the boring stuff 
you know, it, free, it definitely frees us up to, um, to solve problems or to, to find answers to things that are, you know, bothering us particularly, in specifically, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and added to that, I think this year has kind of challenged people to start thinking about, you know, what do I really want to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, there's no such thing as job security anymore. Whether you're working for a corporate or for a startup or your own business, job security is now a fleeting thing. Yeah. So you, you might as well do something that you love and and lose that job than do something you don't love and lose that job anyway. So I think it's challenged people in terms of what they want to do with their, with their careers at, at the end of the day as well. So it's, com it's, a, it's a combination almost of the, these two uh, forces, you know, where a lot of jobs are being becoming automated actually but i think a lot of people are feeling more empowered to go after for the after the jobs that they really want now Definitely. and be more fulfilled and be more engaged as well you know i agree with you completely um so jose has asked um bias of data is an issue in ai what developments and solutions are being implemented to avoid bias i think gary was this yeah i did talk briefly about yeah. that you know, it, it, so it boils down to the training data. So th this is where the, there's an old joke that says data scientists spend most of their most of their job looking for data, and that, that's become so prevalent that now the joke is data scientists spend most of their time complaining about the fact that they spend most of their time looking for data. But it, it's really it's, it's getting down to those foundations. You know, that as, as data is becoming more integral to our business, if we if we are now basically making decisions and recommendations to customers and interacting to customers based on the data, then those foundations of getting quality data are more important. And what that really means is that when, you, when you're when building your models, you really need to go and look for, for the training data. One of the things that, that we're seeing, uh, well, I'm seeing a lot in terms of application of, of, um, of machine learning in particular is what, what it's, instead of replacing people, it becomes machine assisted. So the machine will make a recommendation, which then gets routed to a person who could kind of double checks it. Um, and that then, you know, becomes, and if you think about, you know, these captures that we have now with Google, every time you try and log into anything, you get asked to click on all the blocks that have got an airplane in them. What we're actually doing is we're helping Google to train its engine to recognize pictures of airplanes because it said, I think it's these three, and then it gets verified by everybody. The one test that I fail often enough, I'm just <laughs> telling you, bridges. And the cars. <laughs> so, so, so that's the first step. Anyway, yeah. Not about me. It's to, build, it. <laughs> it's to build those training data sets, bring in external data where we need it, check our biases. You know, our, our, if we if we used to say, for example, that we, we were not going to extend credit to a particular person based on their um, location, based on the suburb that they live in, that's a bias that gets carried into our decision making. And then the artificial intelligence uh, engine might pick up that same decision making it'll make the same decision but no one will understand why it was making it so to really look at our okay. data and understand you know when our model is using a data set what are those biases what's in there what was previously the decision making processes that may not have been spoken about um and how do we how do we add data in or manipulate the data in such a way as to make it more valuable so, the, so that's really where the, where the progress is being made it's around that machine assisted and using humans to train the data set so that the models become better yeah, I think it's a I think it's a big issue actually. I think it's going to continue to be a big issue, and that's why uh, explainable AI is so important. Actually, the fact that you need to be able to explain what decisions are being made through your algorithms and things like that as well, because I think I think that's probably the biggest threat is actually is all the bias that could be built into uh, training systems and AI systems as well. Actually, and uh, I don't I don't think you can actually re remove it completely. I think you have to put safeguards in place, basically, and and, and be able to uh, um, create some sort of diversity in terms of how you're designing things and have a diverse team of people that are actually working on these projects as well to try and uh, you know manage it to a certain extent. I don't think it's it's not avoidable though. Uh, yeah. So it's it's a it's a real. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question here. Is there an issue where people have a stigma that AI and data is used to invade their privacy and collect data that they did not consent to be recorded? Anyone? Um, 
I'm assuming there is, but um, anyone want to take that? I, I'll take this. I'll take a stab at it as a starting point. Okay. It's very age dependent. So you know what you see with the younger generation, my kids that grew up with cell phones, for example, they're far more um, open to sharing information. And I think any of us that, that use Facebook, for example, um, we've consented to giving away our data. Um, same thing with the cell phone. Every time you move anywhere, the, that company is tracking your every move. They know where you are, what you do, what your habits are, etc. So there is a stigma for, for, you know, I think those of us that are more data aware, probably, I'm, I'm certainly quite conscious of what I post on Facebook and what I don't post on Facebook. Um, I, I try and block my phone for certain, uh, you know, I don't leave my location on all the time. I try and block location for, but the honest reality is I accept that if I've got a cell phone and I'm carrying it, people are tracking me. So I think a lot of the stigma is going away. What things like Protection of Personal Information Act though are bringing you to play uh, is, is potentially consumers are becoming more educated about their rights. So I, I see that privacy really is more of an opportunity for businesses, you know, that the companies that get this right and, 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 the consumers that feel I can trust this organization not to abuse the data I'm sharing with them, they're going to use it to benefit me, not to abuse me. Those companies are going to have an advantage over the over the ones that abuse the data. Um, mm, that's my personal opinion. Uh, yeah, but, but at the same time, I also feel that uh, there is need for education. But I will agree. Like from home, your kids, they are enticed by these applications to capture or to they share as, as someone is alluded to. So there's need, um, charity begins at home. Can we train our children to be able to be careful that once you capture your name, your address on this particular app, it's gonna be used against you. And these are the issues. So it has to start from home and then obviously in corporates as well, you know, particularly those applications, those phishing emails that comes in to say you win something, you win a million rand, click here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, it <laughs> you. <laughs> then it attracts you, you know, to capture your password and so forth. These are the sort of things as a company that we are doing in corporates where we train what we call cybersecurity awareness. It's very, very, very important. Sometimes you don't know whether you are giving away company information, corporate information, yeah. and that end up, you know, your company being. Uh, people even using your information to hack you uh, in the background. So the education aspect is very important because as much as we are knowledgeable, few of us, but the majority are not. So hence uh, education is key. Yeah. So we've got another question, which I think is great. Which top skills and skills groups or skill groups do employers see as rising prominence over the next decade? So obviously because machines are going to, or AI is going to start taking over. Um, what sort of skills should people be looking at gaining or getting in the next couple of years? Anyone want to grab that? I think we've lost your gauge. Well, um, my opinion is I think um, people that can play more of a connected role between technology and and uh, business and you know the product owner type of roles i think those are really exciting type of positions in organizations that are becoming more and more important i think they they could be critical uh to design better solutions uh that people that can understand technology but can apply it in an empathetic way to people's lives and to businesses as well um if i was going to start my career again i would get into that kind of space i think it's a very exciting space uh, to play that kind of connector role between tech and and people, actually. Okay, <clears throat> great. Sorry, I'm just checking the chat. Um, I think that's it. What I've got so far. Anyone else want to talk about skills that need to be gained? I can, I can jump in quickly. Perfect. Thank you. Just yeah, just just from from our point of view, obviously we because we play more in the. Yeah customer experience space or you know, get involved more with uh, businesses that have a customer experience department or customer services part department. And, and to the points that the gentlemen have raised before with, and, and you guys just raised with um, you know, AI, it's really good at targeted applications. So it's really, really good at singular, almost singular applications or singular uh, problems. So what we see is, um, not necessarily that it'll re again replace anybody. All it'll 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 do is that it'll allow people to upskill 
um, in the sense of being more uh, knowledgeable about the thing that they are supporting the customers with. So the skills I would see that would be more required or you know, more prevalent is more the critical thinking kind of skill, the more problem solving skill. Um, and uh, again, empathy. Um, people don't, although machines do, uh, are able to solve problems, they aren't able to show empathy. They, they don't have a concept of emotion. So that's where people and people, your, your skill to empathize, your skill to uh, problem solve, the more complex problems that machines won't be able at well, at least at this point in time, be able to solve. Um, and then obviously the critical thinking part. So I think that's um, where we'll see more skill requirement or more focused skill uh, requirement going forward. Okay, perfect. Anyone and, else want to add? And, and also in terms of skills, <clears throat> as much as we want people that can translate business requirements into technical, oh, sorry, te technical um, um, solution, technical, uh, technical technology into, into business to solve problems, so to speak, there's need also to come up with, to, to have developers. Because these, uh, the AI, uh, there is an app that is running in the background. So you need to really be able to develop these applications in order to suit whatever you want to do, because it's basically algorithms and so forth and so on. But at the same time, we also need business analysts that enable to understand what the business is. Because there's one thing to be a, a, a developer. A developer just is interested in technology, but this, the business person then takes this platform and be able to add value to a customer, which is the ultimate goal. So, so there are those two roles that are very, very important, not just uh, uh, one, but both of them to understand the business requirements and then to write, uh, uh, um, uh, to use uh, uh, developing skills or the platform, the technology to then be able to automate uh, whatever you want to do. So if I can touch on, on, on answering the question as well, I think that, you know, that's, there's a multi-pronged uh, capability. So for sort of junior people entering the market, particularly for people that, that don't have degrees or are not qualified, you know, don't qualify for degrees, there's a, there's a massive opportunity in the whole cloud space. So uh, a cloud is a very big area, but a lot, a lot of um, our data-related activities are moving to the cloud. It's, it's being stored off-premise, and those cloud areas create new opportunities for, for um, you know, IT administrators, for, for analysts, for all sorts of technical skills at, at a fairly junior level that, can, that somebody can build a career path on. Them. And it's a global demand because I can sit in South Africa and I'm supporting the U.S. market, for example. So that's an, a real area of opportunity. I think at an executive level, um, more and more we're seeing the need for data literacy. So we talk a lot about being data driven, but really a lot of people struggle just to be able to interpret data. So I'm, I'm not talking about you know that every executive needs to become a technical expert, but what is becoming more and more important is the, the ability to be able to ask the right kind of questions about data, to be able to look at a report and say, I understand the context. I understand where this is coming from. I know that I can trust it. I know I know the difference between report A and report B that are both showing me the same information but giving me a different recommendation. Those things are becoming increasingly important so that we can do our data driven marketing, our AI, etc. So I would say those are the two sort of extremes. At the management level, we need to be investing more in understanding how to use data and then at the, at the sort of entry level data is get, get hands on um, and the easiest way to do that is without technology. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to do some um, closing remarks. <laughs> Every time it switches over to me, I'm in some weird facial thing, so I hope it's flowing nicely on your side because it's whatever's happening there is not lovely. So um, let's just do some closing remarks. I think, Peter, do you want to start? Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, the, um, I think you, you should also uh, mention that, I mean, at the moment we we are at a stage where, um, doubling down on what she said, so AI was a big hype. Um, there was a big hype around it and people went on and deployed it and Microsoft turned out to, you know, create a chatbot that, um, to yeah, be a little bit uh, non-politically correct if, if that's a, a soft way of saying it. So with time, the, the companies have, or businesses and, and technology providers have realized that you can deploy AI at this point in time and then there's focused, um, focused applications to it. You know, giving uh, AI a specific linear task or a simple task to take care of is really, really good. 
um, at that at this point in time. And that's what we need to leverage going forward, whether it be, you know, using sequence learning on the website, like I showed, um, yeah. you know, being able to understand the journeys on the website and then acting on that from a business perspective, using that for your business outcomes versus just solving a self-service um, requests, you know, reset my password from an IT perspective or um, I need what is my account balance, as an example. Yeah. Um, using those targeted applications, practical applications of AI will, will surface those business outcomes we're looking for at the moment. And then as we evolve into um, AGI and ASI, um, that might change. But for now, yeah, don't be scared of AI, but just apply it practically. Thanks. Um, Lloyd, do you have any I think um, what the previous gentleman has alluded to is very important. Um, technology is very good. It enhances, um, um, in fact, it, it enables us to do things that uh, faster and efficiently. But I think we need to take cognizance of the fact that we need to know the disadvantages and uh, the, the demerits and the risks that this technology uh, brings about and make sure that also when we use it, we ensure that, um, you know, the, the, the information that we are using out of it is not, is, it, we don't have people that come on the back door and, and try to steal the technology or we use the correct information so that we get the correct results. But key for me is cybersecurity is very important as we grow this industry um, of AI. And, and be able to do all these things. And one should take cognizance of that. And also the aspect of training is, is very important to train even right from home, right into the corporates to ensure that uh, uh, we understand what AI can do. Perfect, thank you. Um, Gary, you're the last man standing. <laughs> and, uh, um, I've, 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 oh, yeah. I've said a lot already today. I've taken my fair share of time, but yeah, I think it's important to realize that AI is just a tool. It's not. It's not. Gonna, it's not a magic wand. It's not going to solve all the problems. And the, the differentiator really is in the data. So if you're thinking about AI, but you haven't sorted out your foundations of data, then have a look at those foundational issues. Give us a call um, or reach out to somebody else. But have a look at getting those foundations in place because without trust, AI can't work. Um, that's the thing. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, so gents and um, ladies and gents, um, we are going to move to the lounge now just so that everybody can have a, a chance to sort of network a little bit more. I just want to thank um, our sponsors again, Genesis, thank you very much. And um, thank you for organizing the conference. We really enjoyed it. It was good fun. So we'll see you next door. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you very okay. much.